Today, we are continuing in a series of messages called, You Have Seven Unread Messages. I know this is a strange topic. It's a strange title for a series because I don't think a person exists who has seven unread messages because there's two type of people. There's the zero unread message people, and then there's the 55,000 unread message people. How, how many zero unread messages people in the room? We got you, you keep that thing at zero. Oh, my goodness. This is a conscientious group. My goodness. So, so how do you do that? You just constantly open it up. You just constantly, no matter when it is, you're like, well, I got to read it now because it's here now. Really? It controls your life that much? I'm just uh, kind of exposing that I'm the 55,000 unread message type of person, okay? You know how I do it? Really easy. Just leave it. I'm convinced there will come a time where I've got some time and attention and I will look at it then. Now, just kidding. If you reach out to me, I'm going to reach back. I just have a couple of emails that are kind of like the old ones that I don't use anymore. And you just fill them out when you're like registering for something. Anyone else know what I'm talking about? And uh, I had someone after the first service like, Pastor, you know that you could just make sure the notifications don't come from that email, right? I'm like, I guess, but having that number on there does not bother me at all, okay? As long as I'm responding to the people that I love, we're good to go. But, but today we're looking at a different type of unread message. We're looking at seven letters that were written to specific actual historical churches in the book of Revelation. If you have your Bible, why don't you turn to the book of Revelation chapter 2. We're on week 4, so that means over the last few weeks we've looked at three different cities. We looked at Ephesus and what the Lord has to say to the church in Ephesus. We learned a little something about Ephesus. That yes, it's good to do good work, but you better not forget to love the people around you as well, to continue to love one another, not just fall in love with the work, but keep a soft heart. That's a good thing for us to learn. And then after that, we looked at a, a different church. And there, there's seven different churches that kind of go in this counterclockwise circle. They were actual historical churches. So we had a look at Smyrna, and then we had a look at Pergamum. Today, we're going to read a letter to the church in Thyatira. What we're going to do is I'm going to read it, we're going to pray, and then we're going to draw some conclusions. I know, I know, I'm being very direct today. In fact, the title of the message is Very Direct. Anybody in the room, you're a very direct person? You know that you're a very direct person because people have told you you're a very direct person. And when they tell you that, they're usually thinking that that's going to make you feel bad. I just want to say, if you're a very direct person, good for you. We need more people like you. The indirect person who has told you that you're a very direct person was actually trying to say something different. They were just being very indirect. What they're trying to say is thank you for being direct, but could you just be a little more gentle? That's what they were trying to say, and I know you didn't hear it because you're a very direct person. So when they said, you're very direct, you're like, what? thank you. And then they were confused because you responded to their insult with a thank you. The thing is, they were indirectly trying to say, if you could just be a little more gentle with your directness. Okay, so I'm just going to try to translate today in that very directness. We need more direct people. Good for you. Uh, Jennifer and I have eight kids. And across the, the course of our children, there is a spectrum of directness. There are some who you can tell they want something, but they're not going to tell you. They're like, well, I was just, it's okay. But my son, Zion, he turned six today. And Zion is very direct. We've been counting down in the last 75 days for this birthday. He makes sure everyone knows, guys, 73 more days. Well, today was his day, and he came upstairs. He's like, nah. He's very direct. He's made it very clear. I want to drink some Nest Tea iced tea and have burgers. And so guess what we're doing today? Nest Tea iced tea and burgers. Because there is actually something great about directness. In our household, I actually do I was going to say almost all. I do all of the grocery shopping, like all of it. I run that, that particular errand is one that I run. But Jennifer makes a list. She doesn't just say, why don't you go pick up some stuff? Because I'm going to come home with some different stuff than she was thinking. So she makes a list. And before I leave the house, I'm like, I'm just going to read through this list and make sure if I need some clarity on what you mean by this, there's no chance I'm coming home and her going, well, what's this for? Because there is something valuable about being very Direct. What we're going to see in this letter, which I'm about to read, then we're going to pray, and then I'm going to share some very direct thoughts. What you're going to see is that Jesus is actually very direct. 
in this particular letter. He doesn't leave much for us to imagine or us to kind of self-identify. I wonder what this could mean. He's very direct, and so I'm going to do my best with gentleness to be very direct today. Does that sound good to everybody? Come on. For those of you who just said amen, thank you for being very direct. I got an expectation of you today. To to respond that way is actually really helpful. You really help a preacher out when you respond that way. You get better preaching and you get shorter preaching when you give a little amen. Did you know that? And when you give an amen, now some people got excited about amen. Like shorter preaching. We're going to get to this Chipotle. We're going to do this after church party right away. You get better preaching and shorter preaching because the preacher feels secure. You understand what I'm, I'm meaning. Now we can move on. Hey, you got it. Okay, here we go. Revelation chapter 2, starting all the way down at verse 18. Let me read this, this to you. To the angel in the church of Thyatira, write this. These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and your perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless... I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads many servants into sexual immorality and eating food that's sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I'll make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead, then all the church will know that I am the one who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each in accordance with their deeds. Now, I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to that which I have until I come. To the one who's victorious and does my will to the end, I will give the authority over nations, That one will rule with them, and with an iron scepter will dash them into pieces of pottery, just as I've received authority from my Father. I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears to hear what the Spirit says, let them hear. Jesus, I thank you for your word. I pray over these next few moments, you would give me clarity and brevity of thought, that we might be very direct with what you're speaking to us, and that we would leave today with some actionable step that we can actually put into practice and see the results that you long for. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said? Amen. Amen. If you're taking notes, the title, Very Direct. There's no no guessing what Jesus is getting to here in this letter. There's no room for us to, to wonder. I wonder what he meant by that. There's some really clarifying and clear language. And so today I want to bring four thoughts that are actually very direct. Four thoughts that I believe we could take action in our own lives and we could learn a little something from what God is trying to speak to us. Now this particular church was in a city called Thyatira and Thyatira amongst the seven cities that received letters is by far the smallest of those cities. And it wasn't just small, it was also not considered all of that significant. In fact, Pliny the Elder, who was a a philosopher and a scholar in the early Roman Empire, he is quoted as saying, in places like Thyatira and other insignificant cities. So amongst the, the, the common thought of the day, Thyatira was small, and because it was small, it was insignificant. Thyatira was not all that popular. It was probably not on anyone's bucket list, like, oh, before I die, gotta see Thyatira. Thyatira was probably not the type of city that you're like, if I'm there, I'm going to take a picture. i got to tag it because all my friends need to know I've seen Thyatira. By the way, for some people, if you pick your holiday destination based on what will be the best post, you might be missing out on the whole purpose of a holiday. you got to just get away and be there. But Thyatira was not that place. It was not that popular. The only thing Thyatira was really known for is that it was a place where people would dye cloth the color Purple. I mean, you're probably working your way down the the list of significance if the thing your city is known for is like, oh, yeah, where they have purple T-shirts. Cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Someone's like, where are you from? I'm from Thyatira. Oh, the purple place? Awesome. It wasn't all that significant, but, but let me be very direct with you because Jesus is very direct, and this is life-giving, and it speaks purpose to us. Size 
and significance are not directly correlated in the eyes of God. Just because people might see size and significance as directly correlated, God does not. He's speaking to a church in a place that's small. He goes, I just want you to know, I see you. I see your deeds. You stand out to me. It's not size that stands out to God. It's not the, the, the larger type of impact. In fact, as you look through the whole body of Scripture, you will see this theme that, that reoccurs over and over again, where God says things like this, celebrate the days of small beginnings. You know what gets people real excited? When someone posts a photo with a really low quality, black and white sonogram picture. People get real excited. They're like, oh, I'm so excited for the future. Nobody gets online, you know, we're just posting a picture, we're having a baby, like, sounds pretty small. You know? Oh, I'm so excited, I'm an auntie, you should see a picture of my, my nephew. And then you show them a picture of, wow, he looks pretty small, don't know why you're so excited. No, we get excited for small beginnings. We get excited for small things. In fact, it's the little things that have significance, and you need to know this, that size and significance are not directly correlated in the eyes of God. For some, the, the thing you're doing right now feels small, and because of it, you think that it's insignificant. Not the case. Maybe right now you, you are running a business that feels pretty small, and so you think it doesn't matter. It matters. Maybe right now you are developing a skill set that doesn't seem that big, and because it doesn't seem that big, you don't think it matters. It matters. God sees it all. Maybe today you are fostering a gifting that is spiritual. You are trying to develop a ministry. You are trying to build on, on a skill set you have. You are addressing a need or an issue in your life, and it feels small, and so you think it's insignificant. Let me be very direct. Size and significance are not directly correlated in the eyes of God. And if that's the case for God, then it should be the case for us as well. In fact, to this church, he addresses them this way. He goes, I just want you to know, this letter is coming from the Son of God. Now, in that time and language, to say you were the son of something is to say that you possess all of its attributes. So in the Bible, when Jesus called James and John the sons of thunder, he was saying they possess all the attributes of a thunderstorm. When the apostles referred to Barnabas as the son of encouragement, they were saying this guy right here, he possesses all of the qualities of encouragement. Whenever you're around him, you man, you just get filled with courage. So when Jesus is referring to himself, he goes, I'm writing you right now, just so you know, the son of God. He's going, I possess all the qualities of God. God himself sees what you are about and what you're, you're doing right now and what you're putting your hand to. And even though it might be small, it's significant. There's a lot of people who think of the thing they're doing right now as small and because it's small, they don't put their best foot forward. They go, once the thing I'm doing is bigger, then I'll be better. That's not how it works. You start in the, the days of when something is small, putting your best into it. You're like, well, the job I'm working is not my career. What's the point of having a work ethic? Small and significant are not directly correlated in the eyes of God. The thing I'm doing right now, nobody even really notices. No one even really sees why I have integrity because God sees even the things that are small. That makes sense? Like, like Jesus goes, he, he puts it this way. Whatever you do for the least, it's like you're doing it for me. I'm watching all of it. Have you ever felt frustrated that nobody seems to notice the little things that you do? Come on, mom's in the room. You can make a little noise. You feel a little frustrated? Like, man, nobody seems to notice the small little things that I do. God sees them. Let me ask you on the flip side. Have you ever felt kind of excited that no one notices the small things you're doing? Because like, it's kind of nice. I can just get away with what I God sees it all. And the Bible says he keeps track and he rewards according to the way we act. Let me be very direct. Small size and significance are not directly correlated in the eyes of God. Number two, actionable step for you and I. A church's culture 
is a result of what is celebrated and what is tolerated. As Jesus is writing to this church, he goes, I I just want to take note here. There is a lot that's going on that I want to stop and celebrate. I want to make a big deal about. He goes, you guys love. Come on, let's give it up. And you guys have faith. Come on, let's give it up. And you guys serve so well. Come on, let's give it up. And you guys persevere. It's unbelievable. He takes time to take note of the things that they're doing well. How many people like to be celebrated? Come on. Come on, raise your hand up in the air. If your hand's not up, you're lying. Come on, we respond to what is celebrated. And Jesus begins this letter. You will find before the letter's over, he also has some critique, but he starts with celebration. He points out the things, the results he wants to see. He goes, your love is commendable. Now, Ephesus, which was a larger city and a more prominent church, they were doing good work, but they weren't loving. He goes, your problem is not, like Ephesus' problem is not present here. In this small little place that's maybe insignificant to some, but not to God, I just want you to know, your love stands out. It's outstanding. I want to say that God sees some things in your life and in our church and in your family that are outstanding. And we should lean into and grow into the things that are commendable. He goes, you got amazing love. I just want you to know, as a church, I was talking to some people earlier this week, and, and uh, we were talking a little bit about the culture of their church and the purposes behind some of their programming and the, the, the aims that they were trying to get. And I'm like, well, have you considered whether or not people feel loved? And they're like, oh, wow. Yeah, I, didn't, I mean... That's a good thought. But yeah, it's kind of a foundational thought. It's kind of an important thing in church. Jesus puts it this way. He goes, the most important commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. I care about these things. So if he cares about it, we should care about it. He goes, your love is commendable. I want to say, like Vivid Church is not everything, but it's a pretty loving place. It's pretty hard. you got to work hard to not make a friend here because people genuinely love you. And we love you before we even know you because we see Jesus do that in Scripture. There's this one time where he's calling a disciple before they even meet. He goes, oh, this guy here, he's awesome. And the guy, how do you know me? He goes, oh, I saw you. You were sitting under that tree yesterday. You're amazing. I love you. And the guy's life is so changed. He says, you must be God. Isn't that amazing how quick love can change a life? How quick love can absolutely change a circumstance. I want to be a loving church. How about you? And he goes, not only are you loving, but you got faith. Because this is not just a feeling thing. Love can sometimes just be this feeling like, oh, there's a warmth and there's an acceptance. But it's not just warm and accepting. It's also incredibly faith-filled. Like you believe the right stuff. Good for you. Man, this is a church that is loving and believing. Not only that, they're also serving. I was talking to a friend this week. And uh, he said this, the church I grew up in was amazing. Except there was really no opportunity for anyone to ever serve or contribute. So it wasn't that amazing. That's true of church. Like, oh, it's amazing. Why is it amazing? Oh, the seats are so comfortable. It's amazing. My goodness, they have a perfect air conditioning unit. If you're watching online, you don't know how uncomfortable it can get in here sometimes. We've got some people in the middle sitting in the Arctic Circle, and then everyone else, uh, yeah, global warming, it's a thing. (laughs) I love the church. It's great. It's amazing. The rooms for the kids are so big. Again, not our venue. Because it was a great church, but no one could ever contribute, and so everyone just kind of left because it wasn't that great a church. There's no such thing as, as a place that you just come to be served Part of uh, what it is to be a church is to be a family that contributes together. So he goes, church of Thyatira, my God, you're crushing it. Love, faith, service. He goes, you also have endurance. Endurance is a good thing, is it not? If you've been around Vivid for a a while, you know we, we probably talk about this, what might seem disproportionate, but it's because it is an essential of what it is to be a Christian. From day one, endurance has been at the center of what the Christian walk of faith is. 
It's the, the consistency that comes in both the up seasons and the down seasons. He says, you're loving, you're believing, you're serving, and you're persevering. Why don't you turn to the person beside and you say, that sounds pretty good. Not only are you doing those things, he also says this, you're also growing. You're doing more now than you used to do. This is commendable, by the way. The best things, the best stories of our life are not once upon a time I was doing good things and then I plateaued. The best stories in life is that you grow and then you plateau, but then you grow. And then after you plateau, then you grow. And after you plateau, then you grow. Are you with me? He goes, you're doing more now than you used to do. That's amazing. How many people want your capacity to grow? I want the capacity to love more. I want the capacity to believe more. I want the capacity to serve more. I want the capacity to persevere more. The problem is, that means I'm gonna be in situations that require a little more sacrifice, because that's what love is. They require a little more faith, and that's usually in situations where things are a little hard to figure out myself. They require a little more service, which means I prefer others to myself. They require a little more perseverance, which means some painful endurance, but I wanna grow. Are you with me? Well, well, this would be, I suppose, very easy if our culture was just a response of what we celebrate, but it's a combination of what we celebrate and what we tolerate. You see, he, he says there's a lot of things worth commending. Nevertheless, I got an issue I want to point out. Now, for some of us, the moment someone points out an issue, we are immediately offended. Like, like maybe there's someone in the room, the moment someone says, hey, maybe we should work on this. They're like, I guess I'm just the worst then. If that's you and you're married in the room, stop it. That's not Fair fighting. I guess I'm just, no, no. Someone loved you enough to point out an area that you want to grow. If you're in the room and you're not married, let me do your future spouse a favor. You need to stop that right now. Do not ingrain in that habit or that attitude. This is not what functioning relationships do. Because we develop based on what is celebrated in our life and what is tolerated in our lives. That's how a church grows. That's how a business culture develops. That's how the, the culture of a family develops. It's not just celebrating uh, like growth steps. It's also addressing areas that need to change. As a church, we gather on Sundays. We also gather in, in smaller communities called hubs, like smaller gatherings of people a couple times a month and they're usually built around some affinity. So we got people like walking dogs together and hanging out in parks together. We got people who are paddle boarding together this week, others who are doing arts and crafts and creativity. The hub that I'm a part of plays pitch and putt. Now, if you don't know what pitch and putt is, there's two parts involved, pitching and putting, okay? So, so you, it's like a short golf course, and you bring a pitching wedge and a putter. You only need two because you're only doing two things. You're pitching, and then you're putting. I'm just being very direct, okay? So we showed up at this pitch and putt, and, and we were, we were uh, seven holes in, and then my good friend Declan, who's sitting up here in the front row, we get to this one hole. It's so short. Like, it's really, truly short. It's like 50 yards. And he goes, man, I could almost just, just putt. Like, I almost don't even need to pitch. I could just putt. And I'm like, Declan, it is not called a putt. It's called a pitch and putt. He goes, I know, but honestly, I think I could just putt. And so collectively, those around were like, yeah, you should do it. It was flat. It was straight. It was short. He's like, I think this is within the range of my putter. It looked kind of funny, a guy getting up to pitch with a putter. We all got out our phones, and everyone's like, okay, here it is. We're on the, you know, we're all pretending that we're, we're somehow, like, commentating PG, a PGA event. We're like, here he is on the uh, tee box of the eighth hole. He's pulled the putter, you know, and he gets there. He's like, here goes nothing. And, you know, he putted it pretty close. It went all, all the way across the fairway. But, again, don't get too excited. It was short. It was straight. And it was flat. He got quite near the hole. He, he putted, and then he went to the hole, and he putted. And, and we all laughed, and we all enjoyed Like, that was awesome, man. Good job. That was, that was great. And it was interesting to see just this little bit of celebration in Declan's life. He got up to the next hole, which was not short, which was not flat, and which was not straight. And he's like... Maybe I could putt this one too. 
And you know what we said? Do it, man. Yeah, it'll be awesome. Now, what we were really saying, if I'm going to just be honest, we're competing. And so, like, he's going to fail at this. Do it. This will be great. We're celebrating towards this result. Well, he gets up there, and that's, that celebration fueled him. And, and he actually did pretty well on that hole as well. Over the course of the rest of the, the day, Declan did not touch his pitching wedge a single more time. He just putt-putted. He was playing putt and putt. What was happening is celebration was fueling him to open up what was tolerable. So we got to this hole that all of a sudden is 120 yards long. He's like, I don't know, guys. Feels like a good one to putt to me. And because he was being celebrated, he started tolerating what he wouldn't have tolerated just moments before. This happens in our culture as well. This can happen in your family. This can happen in our church. This can happen in your business where we, we tend towards celebration. The only issue is that culture is a direct result of the two, what we celebrate and what we tolerate. And just because there's some things worth celebrating doesn't mean we need to tolerate what is intolerable. If you're a parent in the room, there is something to be said about positive reinforcement, celebrating the behaviors you want to see. Do you know what else there is room for? Not tolerating what you don't want to see. Like, I don't just roll up to the, the dinner table and wait and let my kid decide what they're going to eat. He's three. He doesn't know what he needs. This week, he, I, I'm like, hey, man, we're going to try a new food. He goes, Dad, I don't like that. I said, you've never tried it. Yeah, I know, but I know I don't like it. And you know what happened? I'm not going to tolerate my three-year-old telling me he's the boss. I'm like, well, you're going to eat it because you're three and I'm your dad. And he had one bite. He goes, I like this. It's amazing how that happens. If you want to develop healthy culture, you need to balance what we celebrate and what we tolerate. When we first started as a church, we met in this, uh, in this room on Commercial Drive. It was a small room in a, in a high school, and uh, its greatest feature was its cheapness. It was quite cheap. And when you're starting out with a group of people, you're like, hey, cheap, cheap is good. We started our, our church uh, in Sunday evenings primarily. The reason being, most of the people we were starting with said, you know what I really love? Sleeping in. I said, you know what? That's good to me. No problem. We'll do evening then. Evening it is. And uh, the thing is, I didn't realize how much they really love sleeping in. Yeah. They love sleeping in even into the evening. <laughs> and so we were getting started. We found a room. We're like, are you excited for church? Like, I'm so excited. I'm like, that's awesome. So I'll see you Sunday. They're like, you will see me Sunday. And then Sunday would roll around, and I'd get a text like, hey, pastor, really excited for church today. I'm like, awesome. That's, cele- that's worth celebrating. Like, I'm going to be there to worship. I'm like, amazing. And like, and I'm, I'm excited for the message. I'm like, that's great, celebrating all these things. I might even bring a friend. Yes, you will. Like, the only thing is, it's just been kind of a long day. I think I'll just be there right on time. I, I can't come and help set up today. No problem. That's why I said over and over and over and over. No problem. I'm just glad you're going to be in the room. And about six months in, when our service is at 6 o'clock, and I was rolling up at 2 p.m. and trying to, you know, with the one or two people who happened to show up, lift things in, and inside I'm going, I can't believe that all these people who said they like a late service because they could come help aren't here to help. And I realized, oh, it's my fault. It's my fault. I'm telling them the only thing that matters is that you're in the room. It's no problem. And I had to to come to our team and say, hey, I'm sorry. I've actually been tolerating something that that is stopping us from being who we're called to be. We're supposed to be a community that loves and serves and perseveres and has faith and grows. And we can't grow if we don't collectively serve. Do you know what else? It was was pretty unfair to the few people who would show up and have to, you know, grunt it out together. And I'm like, ah, thanks. You're here. But where's everyone? And they're going, everyone. I guess I'm no one. Huh. You know what I'm talking about? It was my bad. I was tolerating something that shouldn't be tolerated. And then we're about a year in as a church, and, and we had a few big goals, like these big missions in mind. And so I said, hey, here's what we're going to do, guys. Let's collectively make a determination and make like a pledge. We're going we're gonna to give big towards this big goal. Because you know what happened in that small room? After a while, nobody could ever find it. Every week we had new people. Every single week as a church ever we've had new people. But every week when people rolled in, they'd be like, it was hard to find. It didn't come up on Google right. And then I had to shake like five or six doors and I couldn't find it. 
but I finally found it. And I started to think as a pastor, I wonder how many people didn't find it. And I thought, even though it's cheap, we can no longer tolerate it. Because we can't just celebrate its cheapness. If it's missing people, then we're missing the point. The point of a church is not cheapness. The point of a church is seeking and saving the lost. Are you with me? So I'm like, we need to change something, but changing something's gonna cost something. I said, collectively, come on, let's, let's plan to give. And you would be amazed. All the plans that people had to give, they were good plans. <laughs> they said, here's, I'm gonna plan to give a lot. And I'm like, that's awesome. And we celebrated people's intention. Only issue was that some people never followed through on their intention. You know, we had one guy as a church, remember, Pastor Kobe, you'll remember this a few years back, and he's like, I just want you to know, I'm never going to miss. I'm going to be here every week. I'm going to serve my whole heart and soul is in this. I'm in. I'm committed. And he never came back a single time. <laughs> it was the last time we ever saw him. Now, if we're just celebrating intention, but tolerating a lack of follow through, we're missing the point. Are you following with me? So, so, so Jesus, he's just being really direct. There are things worth celebrating. But I also, we, we shouldn't tolerate a lack of follow through. That's the same, there's a lot of people in the church today, you've got big intentions of how God may use you one day. You've got big intentions of the generosity you wanna have. You've got big intentions about the giftings you wanna develop. I just want you to know, we will celebrate those things, but we're gonna hold you to it. We wanna see you actually complete the thing you intend to do. If you plan to give big, give big. If you plan to show up and serve, show up and serve with a good heart. If you plan to, to dedicate a season to grow, then grow. If you're trying to live clean, we want to help you hold accountable. If you're trying to overcome addiction, we want to walk that journey with you so that you actually follow it through. It is not love to say, well, we'll just, we'll wait until something good happens and then we'll celebrate. And if you don't hear us clapping, it's because you're not doing things good and we'll just passively, aggressively make you guess. Jesus goes, hey, I just want you to know. What I love is these things, like your love is awesome, your faith is awesome, your service is awesome, your perseverance is awesome, your growth is awesome. What I don't love, though, is that you've tolerated the teachings of this woman Jezebel, which brings me to my third point, very direct point that Jesus makes. Tolerance is not a virtue. Tolerance is not a virtue. In the kingdom of God, tolerance is just not a virtue. It's not something God calls us towards. It's not got something God's aiming us towards. And in our society and in our culture, we have been told that the highest virtue is to tolerate everything. But, but to do so, we've got to stop being honest. Jesus goes, hey, I love all the things I'm seeing. Here's what I don't love. There was a woman, now I don't know if her name was actually Jezebel. Maybe it was Gertrude or Susanna. I don't know. But he referred to her as Jezebel, making a really direct statement. There was one woman in the Bible named Jezebel, and she was bad news. Under her leadership in the Old Testament, she led the whole nation into immorality and into idolatry. And he says, there's a, a, a woman at your church. Now, this is not speaking of all women. This is not speaking of all people who claim to be prophets. It was one specific person. I'm glad that the Lord clarifies so that we don't get it mixed up. He goes, there's that one woman. She's bad news. Like, she's leading in a really destructive sort of manner. Now, Thyatira was small. It was not that significant, but what it did have was a strong system of guilds, like unions. So they had all these trade-oriented guilds, and at the center of every guild was an idol that would be worshipped. So imagine you're like, hey, I, what do you do for a living? Oh, I dye things the color purple. Amazing, so I know what idol you serve. And you would show up, you'd get together with all your friends who were going to dye things, and say, hey, before we get our purple dye out here and dye this yarn so we can sell it at a market, let's just stop for a moment and honor this false god. Let's stop and worship this idol together. Let's bow down at this idol together. And so in a compromised circumstance, this church was growing and flourishing with love and faith and service and perseverance and growth. But there was this woman, Jezebel, who was going, hey, it's okay to be this way in church and be that way in the city. It's okay to have one set of standards before God, but then do whatever you need to do to make things work outside. And God goes, I'm actually not okay with that. Tolerance is not a virtue, purity is. Tolerance is not the thing we're aiming for, purity is. And there would have been some in that time. In fact, Tertullian, who was an early church father, referenced this. There was some in the time who said that only 
the spiritual realm matters to God, not the physical. Meaning, do whatever you want in your body, just do whatever you want with your actions, as long as your heart's in a good place, God's good with it. That was a, a thought of the Gnostics. They thought, like, your body is separate from your, your conviction. So you just believe in your heart and come to church and do these good things and then do whatever you need to do to make it work. And Tertullian spoke this. He said there was people who would say, well, I can't help it. It's how I make a living and I must live. To which Tertullian replied, vivere ergo habis, which means must you live? It's actually a pretty direct statement, isn't it? They're like, yes, I believe in God. Yes, I, I, I want to, you know, celebrate, and I want to be celebrated for my belief, but you guys got to live. I, I live in this city, in this culture. I got to still function this way. I don't want to be in a lack of comfort, and God's like, actually, I want you to have a dividing line. I'm not okay with inconsistency as long as you show up on a Sunday. Imagine if God says, hey, guys, you do your thing. I, as long as I just see that love and faith and perseverance, you're serving, you're doing fine. But he loves enough to speak the truth. And he says it, it's actually not okay to be impure and inconsistent. Yesterday, uh, the Whitecaps FC hosted Wrexham AFC. Jennifer and I were at the game. It was an interesting uh, time. We had, we had a good time. It was fun. Had some hot dogs. Enjoyed the, enjoyed the, uh, the space. I love live sporting environments. But it was really odd because when Wrexham scored, the music pumped and everyone stood up and cheered, and the announcer got on, on the, the announcer, he's like, go! And everyone cheered like it was a home game. And I'm like, oh, that's what we're doing. Okay, this is interesting. We're cheering for the away team. But then the Whitecaps scored, and the same music pumped, and the same, go! And the same people got up and cheered. I'm like, oh, no, you didn't. It was a serious negative aura moment for the guy beside me, cheering for both. I'm like, that's not cool, dude. Like, pick a side. You can't just cheer for everything. The goal is not just we all win. There has to be a side. And what God is saying is, I want you to pick a side. And if you're on my side, and if you're a believer in, in God, and you're growing in faith and in love and in perseverance and in service, then I just want you to know, I care about Monday to Saturday as well. And my issue with you is that you're tolerating this woman, Jezebel, who's trying to convince you that it's okay. It's not okay to me. Purity is a high goal for God. Tolerance is not the virtue. Now, now here we are at the Olympics, and uh, it's an interesting time because for some, it's like the only time every four years where we celebrate excellence because in every other setting, we're all winners. Just participating makes you a winner. And then in the Olympics, we go so far as to say first, second, third, and everyone else, right? Interesting, we celebrate excellence. How many people watched the opening ceremonies? Anybody? Anybody? Okay, a couple. How many people saw a picture of a tableau that was like a reflection of a spiritual symbol? Like you wave at me? Okay, you saw it on social. Okay, cool. So way more people saw this one picture than actually watched the opening ceremonies. And, and amongst many of my, my friends and, and people I know, there's this great offense that a scene taken from a painting called The Last Supper was depicted with a totally different set of moral standards and ideals. And it felt like a mockery to, to Christianity in the church. First of all, I love this thought that things that are true can be mocked. And, and it's kind of hard to offend what's true. It's okay. You can, you can say what you want against, because we know it's true. But here's the interesting thing for me, is it's easy to be offended by something that's happening outside in the world and not have that same type of energy when the person who's right beside us, who, who we love, is living in inconsistency. And the call of Scripture is actually not that we get offended by the dark, but that we make sure we're shining light. Does that make sense? Like Jesus puts it this way. He says, before you address the, the speck in someone else's eye, just make sure you've addressed the log in your own eye. It's interesting, because in this letter that Jesus writes to the church of Thyatira, he doesn't say, oh, those guilds, they're bad news. I mean, the church, you got to do something about those guilds. He just goes, not us. Let's make sure we're being pure here. He doesn't critique what's happening in the world or in the city. He just goes, I'm going to be very, very consistent on what's happening inside the church. Before we get offended 
by what might be happening in the world around us. We gotta look in the mirror and say, is there anything offensive in me? God, search my heart and know me because tolerance of what's happening externally, whatever. You do your thing, we'll do our thing. But in the church, it's actually our job to hold one another to account. So there's someone who, who you know, who you love, who is so entrenched in bitterness and you're offended by the Olympic movement, but you're not helping that friend who you love who, who's stuck in bitterness, and the Bible says that bitterness is gonna grow up and destroy them. There, there's a person you love who's caught up in gossip. They just, oh, they love its taste. They can't get enough. And you're like, well, I don't wanna make things awkward internally, but my goodness, do you know what they're doing in the school systems these days and we're all offended at something else? Man, help your friend who's stuck in gossip. That is what the call of the church is. Is. Does that make sense? You got, you got somebody who's struggling with immorality and your silence is an endorsement. Your silence is agreement. As you're like, oh, that's awesome, that's cool. And it's not cool and you know it's not cool but you didn't know what to say and you didn't wanna make things awkward. I just love that Jesus is very direct. He goes, there's a lot of great things going on but tolerance is something that I have no tolerance for. There's a lot of times I think the church has become more tolerant than Jesus is. And Jesus is actually super patient. He goes, just so you know, I've actually given this woman a lot of time. He uses the Greek word chronos, which means a long passage of time. He's like, I've given her all the time she needs to repent, and she isn't repenting, so here's what you need to do. Don't listen to her. Don't follow the so-called, I love he's like the so-called deep ways of Satan. He's like, don't do it. She was convincing people, like, it's okay, God doesn't care, and, and adding all this thought. He goes, I just want you to hear it straight from me. I'm not cool with immorality. It's a hard conversation to have because we're taught that tolerance is a virtue. It's just not one in Scripture. Does that make sense to everyone? You still with me? You still with me? You offended? Don't care. Okay. <laughs> I, I have a, a friend. He goes, you know what? He, he loves the Lord. He's, he's a you know, writer and scholar. And he just said, hey, just so you know. He goes, if I was in your, your job, I think I would be way less offensive to the people around me because I would just spend all my time offending my own church. Like, like truth is kind of offensive. Truth does kind of draw a line. And the importance of scripture is that we speak the truth in love. And that we know that, okay, there is a call of God that we would live in purity. Does that make sense? Okay. Number four, lastly, I'm gonna ask Kobe, why don't you come on back up? Or Joel, you got here. Lastly, very importantly, is God is on a search and rescue mission. So are we. Let me be very direct. The purpose of God is to seek and save the lost. In Luke chapter 19, he reaches out to a man named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus does not follow the same value system of Jesus at all. And instead of rolling up and going, Zacchaeus, you're messed up, dude. Jesus just goes, man, we gotta spend some time together. You're awesome, let's, let's hang out. And time with Jesus is enough to change his whole life, so much so that he goes, my entire value system just changed. And Jesus is like, that's why I came, to seek and save the lost. You see, in this passage of scripture, he goes this, the, the whole reason that I make a big deal about this is I just want you to know, uh, you can see it here in verse, uh, in verse 23, he goes, then the whole church will know that I'm the one who searches the heart and the mind and repays, repays each according to their deeds. God sees our heart, he sees our mind, and he cares about those things, but he also cares about our deeds. Just coming like right against that Gnostic thinking that the physical realm doesn't matter, just, you know, just be sincere inside and then do whatever. He goes, no, no, I, I care about the sincerity of what's inside and I care about the actions. They both matter to God. He goes, I'm searching hearts and minds, and, and I'm, I'm bringing reward. He goes to everyone else, as long as you're not living in that inconsistency, I just want you to know, no other burden, just hold on. He goes, hold on until I come. How long do you have to hold on? Until Jesus comes. Not a minute less, not a minute more. When Jesus returns, endurance will no longer be needed. It's kind of a cool thought, right? In eternity, you don't need to endure. You just get to rejoice. Endurance has a timeline. It has a lifespan. And I want to get really good at persevering, but at some point, I will not need that talent anymore. He goes, just hold on until I return. And here's what I want to give you. He says, I want to give you 
the same authority that the Father gave me. Remember, he refers to himself. He goes, I'm the son of God. So every attribute of God, Jesus has. And then he goes, and I want you, to anyone who overcomes, if you can just do this thing, like draw a line and stay pure. Like stay sincere. Continue to try to live out those convictions. And when you fail, hey, you're doing better than you used to do. Just keep growing. Hold one another to this. When you fail, I give you time to repent. I want to I wanna bring everyone over to this side. I'm seeking and saving the lost. He goes, then I'm going to share with you the same thing the Father shared with me. Not only that, he goes, I'm going to give you the morning star, which in Revelation 22, Jesus says, is himself. He goes, if you can just endure, you get me. You get relationship with me. I'm here to seek and to save. I'm on a search and rescue mission. If that's the purpose of God, then it has to be ours as well. Our goal is not to insult the world because we're offended. Our goal is not to critique culture as if it should share our value set. Our goal is to spur one another on towards love and good deeds, that we might reflect the light of Jesus' life for all to see. And in interaction with us, people like Zacchaeus meeting Jesus would go, oh wow, that's amazing. Jesus says, I'm the one who's got eyes of fire and feet like bronze. Someone's like, man, should have said feet of gold, the Olympic season, maybe feet of silver. You're basically got fourth place feet, just bronze. No, in that time, bronze was the strongest metal that was known, and it, was, it came to its strength because of its purity. Jesus goes, I'm the one who stands on purity. It's been refined, and my whole foundation is purity. And it gives me the ability to see. I want you to share that foundation so you can see things clearly. Share the morning star. Share the vision that God has for the world. His purpose for us, let me be very direct, is to be on a search and rescue mission to bring hope to the world around us. And that hope does not come by saying everything is tolerable. It actually comes by saying, even though we're different, I still love you. I don't have to endorse, I can just love and let God change things. Are you with me?